Okay, so right now we're, we're going to do some fun stuff. Um, this is sort of, uh, you know, the, for somebody that works quite a bit in RF engineering, this is my favorite part of the transmission line unit because we talk about high frequency sinusoids on transmission lines. In fact, it doesn't have to be that high a frequency. You power engineers will use high fre uh, sinusoidal transmission line theory all the time. Your wavelength is really, really long because your frequency is down there at usually 50 or 60 hertz. But of course, your transmission lines are really, really long too. You're taking power across the country on high voltage lines. So it all kind of scales, right? So let's ta start our new unit on uh, open and short circuit loads. on transmission lines. Did our phaser review. We did our basic sinusoids on transmission lines. And let's recall what that was. The general solution when you convert it to phaser form for sinusoidal excitation of a transmission line is going to be V phaser, that's what the squiggle means, as a function of space, not a function of time, because we have a time harmonic system. It's only sinusoids. And we pulled that uh, uh, cosine 2 pi f t component of the dependency out when we converted into the phase do phaser domain. And for that, we're going to have a general solution. In fact, I'm going to write it like this. We have a forward propagating amplitude and phase. So I'll allow this to be a complex number. There's nothing illegal about that. It just means that there could be a phase along with it too uh, to denote a different starting point in the phase of the sinusoid. And we said that the forward propagating wave will have minus j beta z, where beta is 2 pi over the wavelength. We call beta the wave number. It happens so often in electromagnetics, it gets its own term and its own variable. And its units are gradients per meter. Wavelength, of course, we know from physics, lambda times frequency is equal to the velocity of propagation. As the frequency goes up, the wavelength shrinks. And that's a forward propagating wave. Looks a little different than our time domain solution, but it means essentially the same thing when you put a sinusoid in. Then we also had EXB to the positive J beta Z, the plus J beta Z linear phase taper along the transmission line indicates uh, backwards pr traveling propagation of sinusoids. And that may also have a different amplitude and phase. Now, one little change that I'm going to make from the way that we normally do things. Normally, when I graph transmission lines and talk about voltages as a function of space or currents as a function of space, I always label this part z equals to zero and this part over here z equals to capital D, the length of the line. So if we had a line that was d long, it was z naught and a certain beta for a given wavelength of excitation or given frequency. I'd say this is equal zero, this is equal d. Well, for convenience, and you might see why we do this in a little bit later, I'm going to actually call this area over here z equals to zero, which would make this z equals to negative d. And the reason is what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some uh, reflection coefficients. And in order to do that to my V plus and my V minus, it's good if everything is referenced to the end of the line at Z equals to zero. Otherwise, I could, you know, if my V pluses and my V minuses are referenced to the front of the line, I have to take into account the phase changes of each of them with respect to uh, the distance that they've traveled to and from the end of the line. And that just complicates the, mag uh, the mathematics. This will make things a lot easier, and you'll see, see why. And of course, wherever there's voltage, there's got to be current. And that takes on a similar situation, similar mathematical form. I just got to divide the amplitudes by the intrinsic impedance, and I got to remember to flip that sign. Otherwise, everything remains the same. Okay, so this is how far we got last time. 
Now let's do something interesting. I've intentionally left the load off of this thing uh, to denote that we have an open circuit. Now what is the reflection coefficient of an open circuit? Positive one. Positive one. So in other words, and, and nothing's changed. Just because you got sinusoids, they're going to reflect with positive one reflection coefficient too. So as measured at the end of that line where z equals to zero, at an open circuit, my gamma sub L, which in this case is positive one, times my incident voltage should be equal to uh, my reflected uh, voltage. So in other words, these are actually equal for the open circuit, just like in the, um, the case of the time domain. Now what does that do to the solution? So let's look at voltage and current. When gamma sub L is equal to plus one. Well, my voltage as a function of z, I've got v plus and v minus equal to the same. So I'm just going to factor a v plus out. And when I do that, I get exp minus j beta z plus exp plus j beta z. Since V minus is the same as V plus, I can substitute V plus in here and then I just factor it out. Everybody see how I got that, right? Okay, and for no apparent reason, I'm just going to divide this by 2, which means I've got to put a 2 out here. Why would I do such a thing? Euler's formula, yeah, what is this really? Cosine. Cosine, excellent. Oh, I have such well-trained mathematicians in my audience today. Good students, good students. I can't tell you how disheartening it is when you have 50 extremely talented undergraduates. You ask that question, and everybody just looks, looks blankly back at you. Yeah, know your complex formulas. It's powerful. So really, what do we have here? We've got 2 times an amplitude and a phase times cosine beta z. Interestingly, if, if I had had um, the situation where I had a matched load and there was no reflected wave, come over here and, and look at what the voltage would be doing. I would get rid of this part and I just have a forward propagating wave. It's a function of distance, but only in the phase. If I were to take the magnitude of this, I just get the magnitude of my voltage in front, and then what's the magnitude of, of a complex exponential? One. That's right. That's another Euler's thing, right? Exponential of a complex argument, uh, uh, j, purely imaginary argument, jx is really cosine x plus j sine x. You take the magnitude of that, that's cosine x squared plus sine x squared. Take the square root, one for anybody who's had high school g, uh, trigonometry. And so the point is, the amplitude is constant, and it is only the phase that is a function of position. Over here, when we have a reflection coefficient of plus one, it's a different ball game. The phase actually doesn't change. We have what's called the standing wave. Everything is oscillating in phase on that line. And actually, it's the amplitude that changes. And the reason for this is because you now have the potential for constructive and destructive interference. You've got a wave coming down here, this direction, another wave equal and opposite coming down in this direction. At some points, those waves are going to constructively interfere, and you're going to get a peak, the peak of the cosine. In other places, they're going to destructively interfere, and you're going to get a null in the cosine. Where along that line do you get a peak? What's the simplest point in, uh, of the uh, z? that you would get a peak. Zero, that's right, which in our terminology is at the end of the line, right? That makes sense. Voltage should double up just like it does in an open circuit in a time domain, and that turns out that's where the maximum is. Now let's take a look at current. What is current doing? Current, 
as a function of z is equal to v plus over z naught. V plus is the same as V minus, so I'm going to factor out both the common Z naught and the V plus there. And what I have is EXP to the minus J beta Z minus, I can't forget that important sign, EXP to the plus J beta Z. And for no apparent reason, I'm just going to put a J to with a minus there which means I have to negate that, and I've got to put a J2 out front. Why did I do that? That's right. This is a, um, let's see. I need to put my minus sign out here to get this to work out. But this is basically sine beta Z. Let's see. Um, I changed the sign of the exponentials, so I should put the minus sign out there. Yeah, I was a little sneaky how I did that. Yeah, I did, then I moved it. I realized like I couldn't apply my perfect Euler's formula with it in the bottom still. Ah, so now the amplitude of the current waveform is doing the exact same thing. Remember, current is in the same amplitude proportionate to its impedance as the voltage. Uh, proportional to the value of intrinsic impedance, 1 over z naught, uh, as the voltage. And it's going to be constructively, destructively interfering with one another. But notice that at the end of the line, it's at a minimum. Sine of 0 is 0. And that should make good, that, that should sit well with us, right? We've got an open circuit. We can't have any current coming out of the open circuit. If we move back, however, a little bit away from that load, you start to get current sloshing around in this standing wave. Charges are kind of gravitating towards the uh, peaks and then sloshing back uh, away from them over time according to the frequency. So this is really interesting. We've got a, a voltage and a current standing wave. If I were to draw this out on my transmission line, What I would find if I had my little mobile voltmeter that I could move along and measure uh, the magnitude of the phase, or magnitude of the voltage, so let me write this, magnitude of my voltage phaser I would see a peak and then a null, and then a peak and then a null, and then a peak and so forth depending on how long my line was. The peak and the null are a quarter of a wavelength apart. Peak is at the end of my open circuit. If I go a quarter of wavelength in, I actually get a, a zero there. In other words, if I put my voltmeter a quarter of wavelength in and I just sat there, it wouldn't look like the line is carrying anything. Only if I moved a little bit to the left or the right would I register any total voltage on there. I might trick myself into thinking there was actually uh, nothing, nothing on that line, when in fact there could be quite a bit of power being carried. Now the current is a different scenario. Let me draw that. The current and I'll denote this with a dotted line. The current is at a minimum there and at a maximum there minimum there. So we get these goofy resonances on a sinusoidal transmission line with an open circuit whereby at some places I've got all voltage and no current and then as I move along the line, as I lengthen the line, I get to places where they swap. There's more all current and no voltage and all the cases in between. Now this is kind of interesting. It's interesting for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's important to characterize this effect. This standing wave, you can actually quantify it. If you are uh, in the know in RF or you know, electromagnetics, we have this special word 
special acronym. Voltage. Standing. Wave. Ratio. If you are not very cool, you call this voltage standing wave ratio. If you are a little bit cool, you call this VSWR. And if you are a lot of bit cool, you call this VISWAR. <laughs> What's the VISWAR of your transmission line? You hear RF engineers talk about that all the time. Voltage standing wave ratio. This is defined to be the ratio in the linear scale between the maximum voltage and the minimum total voltage that you measure on the line. So in this case, what's the maximum voltage that I, I measure here? Well, if I look at the mathematics, it's actually going to be twice the amplitude of whatever forward propagating wave that I have coming down. That makes sense because there's got to be some place on that line where the two voltages are in phase and they add up. So it's going to be magnitude 2V plus. And of course, what's the minimum voltage on that line? Nothing. There are perfect nulls the way that we've mathematically described this, which means the VISWAR is infinity, positive infinity. Visoir is always between 1 and infinity. And uh, quite often when you read things like spec sheets, for example, if you've got a cable, uh, cableized assembly or something, or a, a component that connects to a 50 ohm line, there'll be a, a column on the spec sheet which will wrote, uh, report the visoir. And a lot of times it'll be in the linear scale like this. A lot of times it will also be in the logarithmic scale, 20 log base 10 of this quantity that I've defined up here, visor. So if the, in the linear scale you can have a visor between 1 and infinity. In the dB scale, what are my ranges of visor? 0 to 0 dB to Infinity. That's right. The lowest value, log base 10 of 1, log of 1 in any base is always 0. So that'd be 0 dB. That's the minimum value. And then it go all the way up to infinity dB. So whether it was in the linear scale or the infinite scale, when I got a short circuit or an open circuit at the end of the line, I have a visor of infinity, dB or linear scale. Now, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I have to tell you this one story. Uh, when I first taught this class, I was doing the transmission line theory. It was like the fourth or fifth week I've ever I had started teaching at Georgia Tech. Then I had to go down to a conference in Orlando. And I met some old engineering buddies from Motorola. And they said, oh, Greg, how's your teaching going? I was like, oh, good. I'm doing the transmission line unit. And they said, oh, transmission lines. I says, I got a story for you, he says. I said, like, oh, great. So what, what were you doing with transmission lines? Well, we had this really high-powered amplifier on the roof of the building. And it was connected by a long, high-powered coaxial cable that was terminated with an antenna. You know, it was probably like 30 or 40 feet, a really expensive cable. And they were pumping literally kilowatts of, I don't know, microwave or UHF energy out. I forget exactly what frequency they were working at. They had this cable run. And normally, what you're supposed to have is a nice matched load. Your antenna should be matched to the line feeding it so you don't get reflections in visoir. Because if you get a large enough reflection coefficient, you wind up wasting most of that power by sending it right back to the amplifier, which in some instances, especially in high-powered applications, can actually damage the amplifier. And high-powered amplifiers cost tens of thousands of dollars when you get into the microwave re regime, or even more in some scenarios. So these guys had, had set up this thing, and they, got, they flipped the switch. And what they didn't realize is that they had kinked or damaged the transmission line in some way and made probably an open circuit somewhere uh, halfway down the coaxial cable. And so they were wondering why their thing wasn't uh, radiating. They didn't get any signal, and they turned it off. And they looked outside. And so you, 
You notice every place where the current has doubled up in amplitude, you get really hot ohmic losses. It turns out there, you know, there's no such thing as a lossless transmission line. There's a, even a little bit of I squared R losses will go a long way, on, even on a copper uh, cable. And so basically, every half a wavelength, <clears throat> the distance between these peaks, he, kind of heated up and literally cooked the dielectric of the coaxial cable. And so it looked like, like a snake that had devoured a family of rabbits. It was like little bulges every half of a wavelength down the line. So he was very proud that he blew up. He didn't, turns out he did not blow up his power amplifier, but he destroyed a very expensive cable. Those types of cables themselves, long, high power cables, uh, can often cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars. So if you ever want to, it's a good experiment though to drive home to the point, the point that on open circuited lines, you get peaks and nulls every half a wavelength. The peaks are a half a wavelength apart, the nulls and the peaks are a quarter wavelength apart. So okay, that's what's going on. That's what's, what's going on with the voltage and the current. Now, I'm going to introduce an effect that, becomes very, uh, that will become very important in sinusoidal transmission lines. And that is the idea of load transformation. One of the big effects when you take into account transmission line theory is the thing that you put at the end of the transmission line, whatever load impedance you put there, does not necessarily look like that same value if I have a line of length D away from that. In other words, you will change what that value looks like as you lengthen the line and you go in and out of different types of resonances. So let's calculate that and see what's going on. So what I'm going to do here, I'll go ahead and leave my diagram up. I've got z equals to zero and z equals to negative d. If I want to calculate the Thevenin equivalent impedance at the beginning of the line for that open circuit, the thing I have to do is look at the ratio of voltage evaluated to z equals to negative d to the current. evaluated at z equals to negative d, right? That's really all I'm doing. I'm looking at the total voltage at the front of the line divided by the total current into and out of the line. And that amplitude and phase ratio there should be my Thevenin equivalent impedance. And let's see how that changes as a function of distance. So let's see. What did our, we say this was? Voltage is going to be 2... V plus with a squiggle on it, we said that the amplitude was a function of cosine beta z. Z is going to be set to negative d because we're moving d down the line back towards the generator side. And it turns out that cosine of beta negative d is the same thing as cosine of beta times positive d. It's an even function. So I can just sort of ignore that negative sign. And when I go to calculate the current here, the expression that I have over there was minus J 2 voltage amplitude and phase divided by Z naught times the sine of beta times negative D. Well, sine is an odd function, so I can actually just take the negative out and put it there. And look, a whole bunch of stuff cancels. I always like that when that happens. Let me put the J up to the denominator. When I put a J to the, uh, to the numerator, when I move it from the denominator to the numerator, I've got to put a minus in front of that. You all remember that? Twos cancel. V pluses cancel. I got 1 over a 1 over Z naught. So I'm just going to bring my Z naught right up to the numerator. And what I'm left with is cosine beta D over sine beta D, which is also known as the cotangent function. And this is a key result. The Thevenin equivalent impedance 
is a function of how long that line is. Let's do a quick sanity check. When d is equal to zero, what is the cotangent of zero? Somebody said it over here. Infinity, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I heard a couple of other answers that made my heart stop. Sorry. Cotan cotangent of zero is infinity. So if I have an open circuit connected to a transmission line that has zero length, the Thevenin equivalent is an open circuit. That's a nice sanity check. It's really when you start getting length is when the interesting stuff starts to happen. Let's graph the cotangent function to see what we're talking about. Cotangent of beta d as a function of d. Well, remember, beta is 2 pi over the wavelength. And I'm going to graph this in functions of quarter of wavelengths. So this is going to be d equals 2 lambda over 4, d equals 2 lambda over 2, and this is going to be 3 lambda over two, uh, 4, make even increments, and then lambda. So when I multiply lambda over 4 by my beta in the argument of the cotangent, the lambdas cancel, and what I really get is pi over 2, or 90 degrees. We already said that cotangent starts out at infinity and eventually comes down and hits zero at 90 degrees, right? You remember that part? And then it starts going over to negative infinity down here. And by the time it gets to here, where the argument of that function is actually pi, it repeats itself. Just like tangent, only one, the reciprocal. Repeating itself every 180 degrees or pi radians. Draw nice. So now, what does this mean for our Thevenin equivalent of the open circuit? Interesting. What this means is that as I start to lengthen my line, my transmission line that ends in an open circuit starts to look like a capacitor. In fact, if I lengthen it enough, I can make that open circuit behave as if it was a short circuit. Oh, you need a short circuit to the ground when you're a circuit board, but you don't feel like drilling a via? Just make it a quarter wavelength long at a sinusoidal frequency. And it'll look like it was a short circuit. Isn't that weird? Or, if you operate over here, you can pick a capacitor of any value out of thin air. Welcome to the really weird world of microwave engineering. If you lay out your circuit board, you can run things like, we call them stubs. And they're just little traces, like microstrip traces, for example, that end with nothing. And from that, we can basically uh, bring in a capacitor or even an inductor if we want. If we go at longer than a quarter wave, like we could make an inductor. Because cotangent evaluates negative. Negative times a negative, this becomes a positive J, as if I had an inductor in the circuit. And yet I made that inductance out of nothing. This is a great way to be an engineer. You can save your company a lot of money if you're designing an RF circuit and you pull stuff out of nothing. Every time you've got to put one of those little surface mount capacitors or RF chokes or inductors into, onto your circuit board, you incur a little bit of cost and also another potential point of failure. <laughs>
another potential solder joint that might pop off. Nothing is always cheaper than something. It's one of the basic laws of engineering, right? And so this you can pull in any value capacitor or an inductor um, from, from nowhere and put it into your board to build a filter, to match a load. I'll, I'll try to remember to bring in a couple examples of this in the next class period so that you can see um, some of the techniques involved. So uh, that's one example of, of why you would use this technique, why we would take a transmission line ending in an open circuit, lengthen it to a resonant length, and just connect it into your circuit. What might be the other benefit of doing it that way? Not just cost, but what's the other benefit of doing it that way as opposed to putting discrete inductors and capacitors in your circuit board? Why would you want to avoid that at the higher frequencies? Parasitics. Parasitics. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Tell me about that. That's exactly right. Um, just, I don't know how to explain it. It's, um, it's just kind of like the capacitor or inductor each device have intrinsic characteristics, yeah. losses to them, and those are called parasitics. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So what Laura's saying, if you can imagine the, you have a capacitor. And you could buy surface mount capacitors that work at high frequencies. The problem is they've got these thin leads that go into the device and connect to the parallel plates. Well. Those leads have a little bit of resistance, and the resistance is non-trivial at high frequencies because of the skin depth, which we'll talk about later. And in addition to that, those leads, because by virtue of the fact that they're small and they're operating at very high frequencies, have inductance to them. And we know that inductance is J2 pi frequency times L. So at really high frequencies, it doesn't take a lot of inductance to make a non-trivial amount of of our react, positive reactance at that uh, junction. And so as a result, you really don't have just a pure capacitor at these high frequencies when you drop it into your circuit. You've got an RLC circuit that's going to have some really weird resonance characteristic. In fact, there's a frequency, usually on the spec sheet of these devices, called the self-resonance. Has anybody ever seen this on the capacitor that they've spec'd out for a circuit? The self-resonance basically is when the, the uh, inductance begins to uh, become important. And if you go too much higher than that, you thought you put a minus J something in there by dropping in a capacitor. It really might look like a plus J something. Or a minus J plus big resistance value that causes you to lose a lot of signal power. And so the nice thing about transmission lines is that they are, are fairly well, easy to design at UHF and microwave frequencies, and, and you don't nearly have to worry about as much of the parasitic uh, inductance or capacitance. Now, the same thing happens if you have an inductor. If you have an inductor surface mount, that is actually going to have some parasitic capacitance between the two leads by virtue of the fact that they're two pieces of metal next to each other. And then there's also some, some some series resistance and some lead resistance and additional inductance as well. So every component has this critical frequency that once you go past it, it starts oscillating between inductive behavior. Some frequencies is capacitive. It'll switch back again. It'll be generally unpredictable. And it'll also start to get really lossy. Much better to make your uh, inductors and capacitors out of nothing using transmission lines. But we've just discovered how to do that with this equation. Any questions so far? Doing pretty good? Uh, tracking well? Oh, yeah. But if I decide to make a capacitor or an inductor or something out of a transmission line, it has to be a specific length. That's right. But doesn't a specific length of the transmission line affect the Generally speaking, no. It's, it's usually the cross-sectional dimension. So for example, um, if you're on a printed circuit board, for example, you draw a microstrip trace out. As long as you keep the width constant, 
the Z naught will be the same. In fact, we have some formulas that we could use at the, uh, that we covered at the first week of class. You can design your for a constant Z naught and then just change the value based on the length. Now, if you want to, you can change the width of your trace, and that will basically change the Z naught. You may want to do that, for example, if um, you are limited in the amount of um, space that you've got. There's one thing, the problem with stubs, the, the, the principal problem with stubs is that they do take up space on a circuit board. So if you're hop operating at pretty high microwave frequencies, that's usually only a few millimeters. Uh, if you're operating you know, close to about one gigahertz, then you're talking about stubs that could be several inches long, several centimeters long. That takes up some real estate on your circuit board. And so instead of lengthening your stub, if you could change the value of Z naught to get your capacitance instead, you might save some space on the stub. So both are design parameters. More often than not, I, I see people that try to keep everything at 50 ohms, which means there's a specific trace size and a constant Z naught that you're always working with, and just play with the length, just to keep things simple. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's see what happens when we have the short circuit case. Here we've got a sinusoidal transmission line, length D, connected to a time harmonic source, and I short the end. It's Z naught impedance, we're still operating at a wave number beta. Just because this is a sinusoidal line doesn't change the reflection coefficient. What is the reflection coefficient of a short circuit? Okay, good. Now, there were some people that participated in the audience. Good, good. Which means that my V minus in amplitude, at, as measured at the end of the line where Z is equal to zero, as opposed to the front of the line where we're saying that Z is equal to negative D, at the end of the line, V minus is equal to V plus with a complete 180 degree phase change there. So when I go to write my voltage as a function of space, what I get is, let me see, I'm gonna factor out that V plus, which leaves me with just my forward propagating X complex exponential, EXV to the minus J beta Z, and then a minus EXB to the plus J beta Z. And by now you can probably figure out exactly what I'm going to do. For no initial apparent reason, I'm going to put a J and a 2 there. I'm going to negate this, which means i got to put a minus J2 out here. This, of course, is the sine of beta Z. So now... my voltage is at a minimum at the end of the line. It's zero, in fact. Well, it had better be, because this is a short circuit. My voltage, if I graph the, the magnitude, looks a lot like my open circuit, but it's just shifted by a quarter of a wavelength. At the end of the line, it's at a minimum of zero. And then, as I move away, back towards the generator side, a quarter of a wavelength later, it's at a peak. A quarter of a wavelength later, it's back at a null. The amplitude is back at a peak. Quarter wavelength later, and so on and so forth. It repeats itself. The current, on the other hand, I'm going to factor out my V plus and my Z naught, my common terms there, what I'm left with when I do that is EXP to the minus J beta Z minus a minus, so those cancel, I should have a plus instead of a minus term there, 
exp to the plus j beta z, my backwards propagating term. And if I put a 2 there, and I put a 2 out there, what I really get is 2v plus. And this is cosine beta d. So the same standing waves set themselves up. In fact, it looks identical to the open circuit problem shifted by a quarter of a wavelength. Here at the end of the line, the current standing wave is at a maximum, and then it goes down to a minimum when that's at a peak. Maximum when that's at a peak. Minimum. Minimum when voltage is back at a peak, and so forth. In fact, as you can probably guess already, we'll see the same load transformation effect too. I will start off with a short circuit. At length equals to d, my Thevenin equivalent for my transmission line is zero, short circuit, impedance. And then as I lengthen that line, it's going to change. It's going to oscillate between inductance and then capacitance. And at some points, it's actually going to turn back into an open circuit. It's kind of strange, you know, this is, but it's a peculiar resonance that exists on the short-circuited line. That if you put a quarter wavelength segment of short-circuited line, you know, short the top and the bottom bar, you will not be able to tell that that circuit is even there at the terminals of the transmission line. You can connect it into a, another transmission line that just looks like an open circuit. It doesn't affect the, uh, the signal flow. So let's just show what that looks like mathematically, so we have the relationship in our notes. Thevenin equivalent impedance is basically my complex voltage evaluated at the front of the line, z equals to minus d, divided by whatever equivalent current, total current, is flowing into my line, evaluated at the front of the line, minus d. According to this, for my short circuit, my voltage here looks like this. Volts, let's see, we said it was minus J to V plus sine beta negative D. Sine is an odd function with odd symmetry, so I can take that and put that in the front. And we said the current was 2 V plus over Z naught, cosine of beta times negative D. Cosine has even symmetry, so I could negate the argument, and it's the same value. Twos cancel. Vs cancel. I'm going to flip this back up to the numerator. So I got a plus j z, z naught. And sine beta d over cosine beta d is really just the tangent of beta times distance. Huh, look at that. Key result right here. If I have a short circuit, let's do our sanity check. If d is equal to 0, the tangent of 0 is 0, I still have a short circuit. Short circuit connected to zero length transmission line is still a short circuit. If I start lengthening that line, tangent of beta d starts increasing in value. It's positive and increasing. And we'll go all the way up to infinity. And so for that first quarter of a wavelength, the equivalent transmission line uh, impedance at the terminals of that transmission line terminated with the short circuit looks like an inductor. Positive j, some number. At exactly a quarter wavelength, recall that's where beta is 2 pi over lambda, and lambda is, uh, or uh, d is lambda over 4. The product of those two becomes pi over 2, or 90 degrees. What is tangent pi over 2? Well, it's infinite. It blows up, right? Which means you're back to an open circuit. And that repeats itself every half a wavelength. So at a quarter wavelength, 
three quarters of a wavelength, five quarters of a wavelength. Every half a wavelength, all the values of a Thevenin equivalent impedance, including this value of open circuit, repeats itself. You get an open circuit again, and an open circuit again, and an open circuit again. Isn't that messed up? But it's nice, too, because you can pick out any reactive value out of nowhere. What would be one of the benefits of using the short circuit transmission line instead of the open circuit transmission line to make a reactive component? Why would I pick one versus the other? What are the factors there? Is it, is it having two lines? Well, we have one transmission line, right? So let's say we're doing this on a printed circuit board. We've got a ground plane and a microstrip trace. That's top and bottom bar, basically. And there are basically two, two ways. I'll, I'll tell you one reason why I would not like to do the short circuit on a microstrip. Because I've got to drill a via. Vias are always a little more costly to fabricate. and more, It involves an extra step. You've got to drill a hole, and then you've got to metalize it. It's nice just to leave it dangling as an open circuit. So in that particular topology, it's not the only topology I can work with on a transmission line, but in that particular topology, it's a little bit easier to do an open circuit. Um, why might, in that topology, I want to do a, sh a short circuit? Risk a little extra complexity. What scenario might call for that? Well, remember, with the open circuit, if I want a capacitor, I don't have to go very far to get it, right? I just to start with an open circuit and I add some less than a quarter of a wavelength of transmission line length, and I've got myself a minus J something. If I want an inductor, I've got to go at least a quarter of a wavelength if I'm starting with an open circuit. Now, from that equation, we can see we get an inductor va inductive value right off the bat. In some ways, that makes sense, right? A transmission line terminated with a little via, a conductive via shorting the end. It's kind of like a loop. The bigger you make the loop, the higher the inductance value. That's coming out of our mathematics. That behavior, that intuitive behavior, is confirmed by our mathematical expressions. So if I'm a little bit space limited, maybe I want to start off with a short to make an inductor so that line isn't long. I mean, you see a lot of tricks where people start meandering these lines to fit into a circuit board so it doesn't take up too much space. Well, good. Any questions so far? I want to show you something. I said, you always just need to ask yourself, you know, what is this good for? They said one thing is to make capacitors and inductors out of nothing. Let me teach you, show you something that's pretty neat that uses open and short reflection coefficients on sinusoidal lines to do something very clever. Now, um, how many people have ever seen uh, a 915 megahertz RFID tag? You know, I'm talking about not the smart cards. Those are inductive. They're lower frequency. They, they were, they're pretty neat technology, too. Maybe we'll analyze them with field theory later in the class as well. But I'm talking about, like, the little stickers that have, like, usually meander ta tags, a little IC in the middle, and then more meander metal there. You seen those in your co-op or you just collect them at home? No. <laughs> Sorry. You use them? Where would you go up? At GTRI. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Over with uh, over in EOSL. I'm an ISD. ISD. Oh, cool. cool. But we just use them for inventory. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're they're uh, nine fifteen megahertz. You have like a handheld reader or a portal or something. Well, we, Both. We use the handheld reader to test out the server that we we're doing, mm -hmm. and then we use the um, we install the actual RFID reader into the. Room. Very cool. Very cool. And that's what operating up at 915 megahertz, where the wavelength in air is about a foot. In medium, it starts to shrink down a little bit. But you always have to worry about transmission line effects in that frequency, even when you're looking at a little tag. In fact, if you wanted to model this system electronically, 
you've got an antenna which has some sort of intrinsic impedance and acts like a source in the circuit. The electrical connectivity there acts like a short transmission line. And then you have a load. Z sub L, which is really the integrated circuit on that device. And this has some sort of intrinsic impedance. Now the way these work, the whole thing these are supposed to do is without batteries, because as soon as you put a battery on an electronic device, you have added a dollar to its cost, bare minimum. These things have to cost like five or ten cents in order to justify their, uh, their use, because nobody wants to pay more than that for them. So all they have is just a piece of paper or plastic, a little bit of metal foil stamped in to be the antenna and the trace, and that tiny little IC that they press in and usually put a glop drop on top of it, kind of seal it in place. And, and that's it. We can't afford anything else. No batteries, no solar cells, no nothing. And then what this does is that when you hit it with radio energy, it's a, like powering up this source. And initially, this Z sub L at this chip, um, there's something called a charge pump connected in there. And it basically rectifies and steps up the voltage, harvests the radio wave coming in, charging up a DC capacitor. And once there's enough charge on there, the logic inside the chip can turn on and start doing things like retrieving its ID from memory and getting ready modul to modulate those bits back to the uh, reader. How it does it, that is pretty straightforward and believe it or not we know enough how to do that now. There's a sinusoidal wave coming in here. Now, the question is how do you transmit back information with minimal amount of power? Because in these kind of energy harvesting uh, applications, there's so little power available to that integrated circuit that you can't make your own oscillator inside there or your own power amplifier or any active component. The only thing you can do is a couple very low frequency operations because that doesn't take a lot of energy. You can even see kind of the same principle at work with your cell phone, right? You know, how long does your cell phone last when you're constantly talking on it as opposed to how long does it last on a single battery charge when the screen is off and it's just sitting on your dresser top? One is maybe a couple hours tops. The other one is days, right? It's not doing anything if it's just sloshing around baseband electrons. It doesn't hardly take any energy. So we've got to get all the RF off of this thing. And so in this scenario, we allow the reader to supply all of the power for communication. So you come up with your handheld reader or your portal device. You illuminate it with a wave. Once the circuit is powered up, you've got a wave coming in here. And one way to, mod to send back information, once the circuit is, has enough banked energy in its capacitors, is to switch between two different loads and hence two different reflection coefficients. Some of these devices switch between open and short. Open and short. Open is a plus one reflection coefficient, so that means that the wave pops out of the transmission line, out of the tra uh, antenna, back to the illuminating reader. So this was the transmitted waveform to the, to the tag. Out reflects the open circuited waveform with plus one reflection coefficient. And then it'll switch to negative one, which will change the phase of the reflection back to the antenna. And in doing so, you can actually do phase modulation. One, zero, one, zero. And all the while, it's your reader unit that's providing the power for communications. All you're doing is just switching a load, which doesn't take hardly any energy. And that antenna is literally wiggling back information that's being transmitted across that space. All between opens and shorts. Any questions? Perfect understanding? Yeah. 
Ah, uh, okay. So if you measure the sort of electromagnetic distance, you know, how, how the phase propagates in space, to go for the wave to go from here into the device to that junction and all the way back, it's always a fixed amount of phase change. And so the only phase change you, you can introduce into the signal comes in this static system from changing the load. So if you go from plus one reflection coefficient or open circuit to minus one reflection coefficient, you're basically changing the phase by 180 degrees in addition to what's already there, but should remain static under a time scale of normal operation. You know, Things might be moving around or something, but in the millisecond or microsecond scale, things look pretty static in these channels. And so you can see very dis uh, these discrete jumps in the phase. Uh, will carry back the information. It's pretty easy to detect. Now sometimes, uh, well more often than that, you design these to, to be matched when they're not modulating and then instead of switching between open and short, a lot of times they will switch between open and matched or short and matched. So reflected wave, no reflected wave. Um, Turns out the, the phase shifting is a little bit better in terms of modulation because you get a crisper difference when you're switching 180 degrees in phase as opposed to just turning it on and off, on and off. Why would you want to do matched open or matched short instead of short open? If I, if I say that the short open is a better way to modulate, why would you ever do the other way? What do you think? Well, the, the, the circuit will stay roughly constant, but I think you're going in the right direction. Um, what will happen, if you are just shorting and opening this circuit, you're reflecting always 100% of your power, just with different, reflect, uh, different phases. If 100% of your power is being reflected, that means none of it's making it into the integrated circuit. And so if you do that for too long, like you've got a data packet with identification um, information to send back, it's kind of like the equivalent of uh, reading some, from your mem you know, the, the analogy is like reading out of a book on one breath, right? When you're modulating between open and, and short, you can't absorb any energy, so you have to have everything banked up. And these things don't have very big capacitors on them. In fact, they try to shrink this, the size of the capacitors because capacitors take up area on an IC. ICs that have more area means that when I make my silicon wafer, I can only cut them up into 25,000 chips instead of 50,000 chips, which means my trips just got twice as expensive. And so they try to minimize the size of those caps on there to minimize the cost of the IC. And what that basically means is that if these go more than a few microseconds without powering themselves up, they kind of like kind of like reading a long sentence on a single breath. You're kind of like gasping for breath at the end and you lose your voice and you die. Instead, they've switched between open match or short match. So they're always absorbing a little bit of energy, kind of topping off those caps so that you can maintain continuous operation and not die in the middle of your transmission. It's a power management trick. That's true. Um, what you, because this is a, a, usually a charge pump is a series of diodes and capacitors, so it's a very nonlinear circuit. That means if you look at it at one power level, the reflection coefficient is going to be different than at another power level. So you kind of pick the lesser of evils, and you usually match this thing as close as possible for the lower power levels, so that it's always absorbing really efficiently when there's not that much energy present. When there's a big voltage present, it doesn't absorb very efficiently, but you don't care because you've got plenty of power to do stuff with, right? It's always that, that worst case scenario that you design to. Good question. Any other question? Okay.
Well, very good. Maybe I'll bring in a couple of examples of uh, RFID antennas and some stubs, people that tried to make capacitors and inductors out of nothing on circuit boards. <laughs>